Professor Nguyen Hong Sung, Vice Chairman Central Economic Committee of the Communist Party of Vietnam, Professor Tetsuya Watanabe, the President of the uh, Professor Tran Van Tho, Emeritus Professor of Vasada University, uh, Professor Ladies and gentlemen, very good uh, morning. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here and to present the insight on the Vietnam uh, energy supply to work clean economy in the future by 2045. Um, what I'm going to array for my presentation today is to give you the overview of what's happening in ASEAN context. So after that, we can deep dive into the Vietnamese context. So you can understand the relation, how the region faced the challenge, uh, as well as the Vietnamese. Uh, in, in fact, I think the challenge are so common because the Southeast Asia has gone through a large dependency on fossil fuel in the past, where our infrastructure are built based on the fossil fuel, particularly coal, oil, and natural gas. So to move away from those, it needs time, it needs appropriate transition, otherwise the cost is going to be very high. Because if you put it quickly, the strain assets like coal power generation, gas, and other facility, for example, receiving terminal and other, can become strain asset. And you have to finance that whole energy system, a new system which is clean and renewable and clean fuel, and you have to finance the strain asset. So that is a great challenge of our energy system in the region as well as for Vietnam. Next. So this is a regional context. As you see that 80% almost of ASEAN context have relied on coal, oil, and natural gas. And moving away from this energy mix, which we rely on fossil fuel, it's not easy as in the context of Europe that they have transformed so long and the trans transition, transformation to clean economy is much, much easier, easier than the Asia context. And I of course we understand that this region need more energy demand, particularly not only Vietnam but the whole region, because we are in the early stage of development. So energy is the input into the uh, production cost. So in this case, you see that the energy consumption keep growing. And the growing of energy is a threat to, to our system because we need to secure how we can find appropriate energy to make sure that our system is going to be clean in the future. But if we are relying on system that we feel that uh, we, we used to it, like coal, oil, natural gas, we, we finally with the technology, the way we operate, uh, the way you integrate more intermittent renewables such as solar and wind, as the professor had mentioned that solar and wind is based on the wind, it is based on the sunshine. So they are intermittent. In this case, the backup capacity, the grid stability, strong grid stability is so important. So these are all the challenges if we are going having to work clean energy, entire energy system. Look at the region of the East Asia, particularly. Uh, we see that when we deployed the most advanced technology in 2050 for the low carbon scenario, fossil fuels still remain in our system on 60%. And we expect that those emissions from the fossil fuel, particularly, will be obeyed by the technology such as carbon capture, utilization, and storage. And we believe that a lot of the coal power plant will be obeyed by this technology with the CCUS. Our outlook really outlook predict that in the ASEAN and East Asia in particular, you see that in the reference scenario, which is a business unusual, if we do not change our system, we continue to choose our asset and we predict those growth in the future to 2050. We will see that in the energy composition mix, coal, oil, natural gas, they are dominant. But 
providing alternative and to work low carbon scenario or carbon neutral scenario, you see that the emission reduction is likely cut because of the increased sale of the new world and clean technology. Uh, this is a very ambitious scenario that the system needs to shift and transform to accommodate more renewable and clean fuel. Emission by sector, you see that mostly in the energy sector, toward 2045 or 50, at the end use sector, we are going to do more electricity. That is a good news. But in the business as usual, electricity is not uh, is not captured with the, the technology of CCUS. But we expect to work 2050 or 60, more of the power sector will be obeyed by the technology of CCUS. And that is a very good news. It combined with the potential of natural carbon sink that uh, uh, Dr. Andrew mentioned, we have abundant uh, resources like wild forests and other that can abate those kind of emissions remaining, particularly in transportation sector and industry. So, specifically between the delve into the Vietnam context and you will see, understand more in terms of what Vietnamese energy system look like. Uh, and if Vietnam vision to work high income country by 2045, what are the challenges? Of course, as many of you are economists, you need a very sustained economic growth, same like the speed of economic growth for several of year in order for economy to take off. I think Vietnam have achieved those, but again, I think many speakers like Professor Wu have mentioned, they were really concerned about the middle income trap. They need to escape from those traps. So that's quite important that to push the, the growth accelerating, and then to make sure we, Vietnam will not become the middle income trap, so they can take off successfully with the help of technology and innovation. And we understand that why there is a sustained economic growth, the word sustaining it means that energy will be quite important in the whole input into the growth model of Vietnam economy in the in the future. As well as like Professor Professor Hemetho had mentioned yesterday, we mentioned clearly about the productivity efficiency. But here is more in terms of how energy efficiency play role into the whole system and also the transformation toward clean and renewable technology. That's quite challenging for Vietnam content. And you see that as a growth production function is a lot production function of the land, labor and capital and where energy is coming and also the innovation technology in Adam will play a great role. In that case, that transformation toward green economy, the rock. The final energy demand of Vietnam, in the past, basically, I don't put the number in here, if traced back 30 years ago, in 1990, biomass played a great role in the energy mix of Vietnam, almost 40, 50 percent. But as the economy of Vietnam has gone uh, growing up, those biomass has swayed away gradually. I think it reduced largely. And you see the role of biomass is not significant much in current energy system. But it replaced by other modern energy into the energy mix of Vietnam. But the sale of electricity is quite important. As the energy sector, I think, we need to promote the use of electricity because electricity can do a lot of function like cooking, cleaning, and other, which is replace the role of biomass in the future. And it's easy to be decarbonize though electricity you look at the source of power generation. It can uh, uh, equip with the uh, clean facility like carbon capture and storage. And of course, you see that in the business as usual, the emission will be remain 
uh, not emission, but the more energy uh, may, will be in the form of the the oil and coal, and larger share of electricity is expected in carbon neutrality scenario. It's gone up to almost uh, over 40 percent. That is a very good move for Vietnam. In the power generation rate, the share of electricity is expected to have a higher share to work over 80% in 2050. This is very good news. You know that recently Vietnam have accelerated a lot of share of solar and into the energy mix and it became very difficult to handle those intermittent because of solar. I think Vietnam has learned a great deal from a uh, sudden influx of uh, renewable, particularly the intermittent from solar energy. And we expect that you see that the, the share of, of uh, uh, renewable, particularly, has a little bit going down toward 2030. It doesn't mean the capacity go down. But because of the share itself, why the energy consumption will go up. So if the, the installed capacity remains the same, so the share will go down. And we expect from 2030 onward, the share of renewable, those solar, wind energy, particular hydro, will take up toward 2050. Uh, this is a very good news, and the power sector will be mostly decarbonized by 2050. So it will become a very really clean power system in, in 2050. For the supply side, um, it's a very good news at the supply side that we expected that uh, renewable and clean fuel will play a great role in the supply side of Vietnam. Almost 50% will come from renewable and clean fuel. So this is quite significant important. Of course, we cannot abandon the fossil fuel completely toward 2050. We still continue to, to use the fossil fuel because they are important. And some of the challenge we understand, like industry and transportation, they still need oil and other, let's say, high quality uh, transformation of coal, coal to natural gas or other form of fuel is uh, ammonia or, or hydrogen. In the emission sector, I think Vietnam shares a similar story of the ASEAN context. Uh, toward 2050, electricity mostly decarbonized at the power source. So this is a very good move. Uh, the remaining only industry and transport that can be, the emission can be offset by, by the introduction of biofuel with CCS or other gas technology like carbon, uh, like air capture technology that we call uh, negative emission technology. Of course, we introduced in the paper that the preparation of pathway for Vietnam to apply carbon neutrality technologies that it's quite important. We need to understand that when the technology becomes mature, we need to understand that financing this technology is a great challenge. It's not all these new technology are subject to the same risk. More of the new technology that we are predicting to roll out with the timeline 2030 onward, for example, like carbon capture, uh, utilization and storage, we expect that ASEAN can be commercialized successfully by 2030. Those technology will roll in. So let's say some other technology like uh, coal, coal combustion with ammonia, we can start right away with a very small share of the blended fuel from 20% of coal ammonia. But hydrogen, the same acceleration hydrogen, coal combust with natural gas, it naturally. I think start from 20% and the share of those clean, clean fuel to the power generation will run up toward 50, 70 and 100% clean fuel in the power generation sectors. Of course, other clean renewable uh, electricity will come in solar wind like Vietnam has abundant of resource particular wind and also wind and also solar. But they are in intermittent where the role of the power trade will come in not only within Vietnam, but in the ASEAN context, we'll have the higher penetration of these intermittent resources. But again, I think the question, how Vietnam are ready in terms of grid, in terms of the AI that 
introduced into smart grid to ensure that the this new uh, kind of uh, intermittent uh, energy can actually well predicted because we need to predict very well otherwise you need a lot of backup system like professor uh, mentioned about what type of backup system it can be in the form of on-site hydrogen which is very clean or in the form of pan hydro storage or mostly i think our system we do gas which can run up quickly to respond in the fast changing of the demand side these are the technology you expect that to roll out in the carbon neutrality in, in Vietnam. Lastly, I think the policy direction, what need to be emphasized for Vietnam to be successfully embarked on energy, energy transition, at the same time achieve the uh, carbon neutrality and also green growth by 2045 or 2050. I think one of the things is the green energy de development uh, that will need to have a, a mix of appropriate technology that to roll in into the energy system which technology we can first and it's important about Dr. Nguyen mentioned about carbon market but more important is how carbon offset mechanism going to play a role here and about that I think it's important it's not just easy as we said because to set up the carbon offset thing you need a set of agreed MOV monitoring reporting and verification because one, one unit of carbon offset has to be if Vietnam is going to set, quantify an agreeable carbon offset, one unit has to be agreed by other countries. So I think systematic and aligned with IPCC methodology is quite important. That in the future we we'll discuss about that, the harmonization of report among the system. That that the basis to be like doing the carbon inventory to ensure that uh, the emission reduction are real. That is quite important when we, before we do the carbon trading. Uh, the next, we understand that all the technology we introduce, it's not easy. But if the power connectivity are there, it can have basically like Vietnam is in a bad position because Vietnam has different climate from the south, north, and from the south, central, and north. So if Vietnam alone can actually utilize different resources, endowment, such as wind and solar. But in Vietnam are connected to a wider network of ASEAN. This will be a very, very perfect. You don't need to have more backup capacity. Backup capacity is, is a cost of the system, cost of, of, the, of the power system that we need to build more to make sure that the system is stable. Um, Another important is uh, set up carbon pricing and taxes. And of course, these are the most important, the most important instrument of economic. That to, when we implement the carbon neutrality, when we are facing our fossil fuel, we need this instrument to roll in to ensure that uh, we appropriate tax to ensure that the new technology can come in. But the instrument itself, when we introduce the carbon price, it doesn't mean that the emission can be reduced in the building. Because it's only the instrument that can generate tax for government to allocate to other activities, whether you subsidize to clean investment and other. But mostly, country also introduce the target emission reduction. When you introduce target emission reduction, let's say going toward zero emission by 2050, then the allowance allocated to each industry becomes closer. So where the innovation will start. So at least they can trade where the carbon price demand will go up. Because why the carbon price is very low? Because there is no enough generate demand. We need to generate demand to push the price. It's a law of demand and, and supply, basically. And of course, we understand that. And don't be surprised when Vietnam is back on worry uh, proactive of the energy efficiency in energy sector and everything you will see that rebound effect in a way that when you implement energy efficiency it's natural that you save energy and in the early stage where you consume energy not sufficient you tend to consume more because you save energy we call rebound effect 
it's natural. Unless Vietnam economic grow to one certain point, you can look at Japan, Korea, and the United States and Europe. Your consumption per capita at a certain point before Saturday point. Then the energy efficiency start to have effect, positive effect. But the early stage, you will see that the more you save electricity by introducing more efficient equipment and devices like light bulb and other, you see we, in, we tend to use electricity more. We cook so far, we not enjoy enough electricity. So we want to consume more, we call it bound effect. That's not a surprise at all. And uh, for more of the emerging uh, developing countries to work high, uh, middle and high, high income. As lastly, I think one of the important that we cannot miss it is about when we scale up the renewable technology, we need to ensure that the supply chain of those products, let's say solar, wind and other, will be available at affordable price. And the secret of those is the critical mineral. If the critical mineral supply are not secure, and the, the, the uh, value chain of those clean technology are not within the region, the cost will be high. Suppose we're just relying on China to supply the solar panel. We know that the panel itself is quite okay cheap in, in, in China context. But when we study about system cost, to move those panels to work installed in Vietnam, Cambodia or Laos, the price is going to be very expensive when we're building the whole system cost. So we need the value chain of those clean technologies to set up within the region to make sure that the affordable price of those technologies in our region so we can accelerate more of the clean technology and, and renewable. Of course, the common ASEAN carbon market is a mess if we need to move toward green economy. This is the, the secret of success. Without the carbon market, it's quite difficult to implement all the clean technology we hope, unless the government has a lot of money to subsidize. But I believe the subsidy is come from tax. So in the same way, the, the best way to keep the market running perfectly is to introduce the carbon tax. And we know that there is a lot of success story from Europe, like ETS, Japan implement that, Korea implement that. We can learn. We understand that ASEAN contact is unique. We don't need to copy from them, but we learn and we build a unique method for Asia that can trade the carbon emission. And we try. We hope we can do it. This is a market enabler, a simple explanation. In ASEAN context, as well as Vietnam, we need three important states. It's early decarbonization. By switching from coal to natural gas is one of the options, cut down the emission by hand. And petrol decarbonization is blend and fuel. Coal can be co combust with ammonia, and gas power plant can be co combust with hydrogen and other technology. And also de decarbonization where the technology with air capture, uh, direct air capture, carbon capture technology will, will come in. And I will study so that in Europe, you know ETS carbon price just about 60 or 70 to 110. It varies around those. But if ASEAN going to overhaul our energy system and to achieve carbon neutrality, we we going to pay very higher price. The marginal abatement cost so that over 300 US dollar per ton CO2 emission reduction that need to be carbonized to overhaul our energy system to work cleaner. And to some extent, it quite go way up to over 600. So that reminds us that for us to reach carbon neutrality and clean economy is very challenging. And we need to find and strive for multiple pathways that suit each country context and circumstance. And we know that the lower carbon price, it doesn't have to create innovative in the clean technology. At least the carbon price reached to $100, like in the Europe market, then I think the early phase out of some of infrastructure like coal-based power infrastructure can stand right away if the carbon price stands around that, that, that price. And what are you going to do through an asset activity, Asia Zero Emission Center? Actually, we are going to 
support the development of common ASEAN market. That will be a future goal. But there are a lot of activities need to be done because we understand that each of ASEAN is, track, is trying their best to understand how to meet the obligation of emission reduction of NDC. So with, with support like Thailand doing their own way because they want to cut their own emission. Malaysia do their own way and I know Vietnam is trying hard to set up institutional uh, set up and regulatory reform for carbon market. They study that. But by the end of the day, ASEAN need to cut up for the ASEAN common market so that we can trade one unit of carbon reduction can be acceptable by other parties. That's the most important. And we hope that through Asia Emission Center, we, we help the country to achieve this thing. I'll uh, stop here, and if you have any questions, I'm pleased to, to respond. Thank you so much.